pleasure to welcome you to our church online here at Hamilton Baptist. Good morning church family, it is my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you to our service here eh, at Hamilton Baptist Church on Sunday the 2nd of August and a special warm welcome to you if you've just been scrolling YouTube and you've found our link or you've joined us a few times or if this is your first time, please you are more than welcome with us. I'm delighted that our former senior pastor David Wilson is here eh, and will be bringing God's word to us this morning. Again the setup eh, is all here in the church so we're delighted eh, that David will be preaching from the building for us today. Just as, as we come and open our service eh, there won't be any eh, announcements this morning but I just want to open with these wonderful words of Psalm 29. They read this, ascribe to the Lord you heavenly beings Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. What wonderful words as we come and again gather in this way together, still online through these means. Week by week we get closer to joining together. But even though physically we are distant this morning, we gather together as God's people to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Because indeed he is holy and his holiness is glorious. And would we know something of that reverence and that awe this morning as we gather together again in our own homes. Some of us may be watching with friends or family and it is good for us to do so. So as we come as our worship team bring to us, eh, as we sing together, I will boast in Christ and this is amazing grace. As Amy again speaks from the life of David to our children and as David brings God's word to us, as we consider what suffering is at this time for a Christian. Shall we pause for a moment? I'm just going to leave a moment of silence for us just to bring our hearts before the Lord and then I'll pray. So let's come and bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, it is our joy and our pleasure to call ourselves your people. Although again we as your people are physically distant from one another, we are this morning again united as your people here in Hamilton across many different homes. But we are united in one spirit. We are united this morning in the singing of your praises in the speaking to our children, in the preaching of your word. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would speak directly to each of our hearts. Lord, would you speak to some of us in ways that you have maybe never spoken to us before. We thank you for all that it is for us to be your people. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to be at work in this world. We thank you for the changes that we have seen in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. We thank you for uh, the way it seems to have almost been eradicated from our country. And Lord, we pray that that would long continue. We pray that we would not see a second resurgence. And we ask for your protection over our nation, though we know we do not deserve it. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you that in the most wonderful moments of life, we thank you that in the deepest and darkest and most difficult moments of our life, that you are our God. And that your steadfast love is with us. And would we always remember to worship you in the splendor of your holiness. Because you are a good and a faithful God. Lord, we thank you for all that you are to us. Would you receive our praises this morning? Would our hearts as we approach you this morning be right in your sight? And we pray all these things in your son's precious and mighty name. Amen. Thank you. We'll hand over to our worship team.
Now and for.
hero called David. Now, when I say the word hero, you probably think of superheroes like Batman who's got all those really cool gadgets and a really cool car, or Spider-Man who can climb buildings and shoots waves, or Superman who's got a cape just like mine and he can fly. But today's hero, David, can't do any of those things. In fact, David was a shepherd, so he worked in the field looking after sheep. We actually met David last week. Do you remember Naomi's story where Samuel went to visit a man called Jesse looking for the next king? And he met all of Jesse's sons who were big and strong. And one by one, Samuel said, nope, it's not going to be you. It's not going to be you. Nope, it's not going to be you either. And he worked his way down all of the sons until he met David, who was the youngest. That is the same David that we're talking about today. Samuel anointed David and said, one day you will be king. And remember as well, Naomi said, even though David was anointed and he was going to be king one day, it would be 15 years later when he would actually become king. So in this story today that we find in the Bible, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David goes to visit his brothers who are soldiers in the Israelite army. Now, the Israelite army are getting ready to fight the Philistines. The Philistines are a scary, scary bunch. There's lots of them. They're very big, they're very strong, and they're very, very scary. One of their soldiers is a man called Goliath. Now, Goliath was very, very tall. He was over nine feet, which is actually taller than Jonathan David, so he is tall. He also had on really strong armour and a big helmet and he had a big massive sword and Goliath challenged the Israelites and he said send forward one of your soldiers to fight me. Now David went to the king of the Israelite army, a man called Saul, and said send me, I'll fight Goliath. Now I bet you're wondering why David went forward. None of the other Israelites did but David, a shepherd who was actually only visiting his brothers to bring food said, yep, send me, I will go and fight Goliath. David had faith in God. Faith that God would give him victory. So what David did was, he went down to the river and collected five stones and put them in his pocket and took them back to the battlefield. David stood on the battlefield and faced Goliath, this big giant, strong, covered in armour, big helmet, big sword. And David had courage and faith that he could face him. He took one of his stones and he put it in a sling. He swung that sling around and he threw it. The stone that he threw landed right between Goliath's eyes and went into his head, knocking him backwards. David, this little shepherd boy, had defeated the big, strong giant Goliath. It just goes to show 
but you don't need to have superpowers or super strength or really cool gadgets or be able to fly to be a hero. David was a hero because he trusted God. He knew that when he stood before Goliath, even though he was so small and not very strong and Goliath was so big and scary, he knew that God would give him victory and that he would be able to defeat Goliath. The Bible is full of heroes like that. Heroes who put their faith in God and God gives them victory. Do you want to know a secret? Our church is full of heroes too. And they're not heroes because they're super strong or they have superhero powers, but they're heroes because they put their faith in God and God gives them strength and courage to face big scary situations in their lives. Have a think. I bet you can think of some superheroes that are in our church. And you know, maybe you even live with one. Maybe you even are one. Enjoy your packs this week, guys, and I'll see you soon. Well, good morning to everybody. It's uh, great to be here in the church. Obviously, there's nobody here, just Jonathan and I, but even so, as I look out here, I think of all the, the different faces, just the people that we love, and it, it just does my heart good to have this opportunity to share here. I count it as a, a tremendous privilege. Just to say that there won't be any PowerPoints coming up. We had them ready, but there's been a wee bit of a technical problem. So if there's any of you folks who are taking notes, you'll just have to take them yourself rather than looking and working from a PowerPoint. But uh, I'm going to read just now from God's Word, from Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to read from verse 22. And we read here, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. But not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Let's just come and pray before we turn to God's Word. Father, we just want to thank you for the relevance of your Word, for the way that you use your Word to speak into our lives in power, to encourage us, exhort us, and maybe at times to rebuke us. But Lord, we know your desire is to speak to your people. May our hearts and minds be open to receive from you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a tumultuous few months our world has gone through. First, the world was, re uh, was rocked, should I say, by the coming of COVID-19, something that we know is a, an ongoing threat. And then there was the emergence recently of the Black Lives Matter movement that really shook, I think, Western society to the core. And we continue, and I think we should continue, to feel the reverberations of that for some time to come. Now, that isn't going to be my main focus this morning, but here I, I think it's right just to make these comments because the Bible tells us God wants his people to be concerned about justice. God wants his people to care about the oppressed. And I just want to say that in principle, I abhor racism. 
and slavery, particularly as was practiced in the United States and in the colonies of Western European nations, including our own, was an abomination. So I want to say I agree totally with the sentiment that black lives matter. But there are, for me as a Christian, a number of aspects about this movement itself that I'm far from comfortable with. The politics behind this, the methods sometimes that are used disturb me. Just for example, I don't think we should rewrite history. Rather, I believe we need to explain history better. That rather than take down statues and rename streets, I would prefer that information was made available that set an individual's life and achievements in a wider context. Also, I think, and I would like there to be, a national monument in a prominent place in our capital city, and that could either be in Edinburgh or in London, that faced up to the, the horrors of the slave trade and expressed our sorrow as a nation at being a part of this. But that, though, was a bit of a, a digression. For the main focus of, one, of what I want to look at with you today is this. And this is something that I think is by far the biggest question of all at any time, and certainly at a time such as this. That is, in the light of all the pain and suffering that there is in this world, is it then possible to believe in a loving and caring, all-powerful God? This is, for many people in our world today, the question. For example, in a fairly recent survey that was conducted in the United States, this proposition was put, if you could ask God one question and you knew he would give you an answer, what would you ask? The top response was, why is there pain and suffering in the world? With the novelist Peter de Vries putting the problem of pain like this. It's the question mark turned into a fish hook into the human heart. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this morning I'm going to be able to give you an all-embracing, conclusive answer to that question. Not that, never that, because there is a mystery in suffering that goes beyond the limits of the finite, limited human mind. But what I do hope to be able to demonstrate today is that faith, does have a credible response to make to pain and to suffering and to evil itself. That faith does shine a light into the darkness of our human pain. In fact, I actually believe that it's the non-faith of atheism that's got a far greater problem and struggle with suffering and with evil. For example, if there is no God and therefore there is no absolute, then what makes evil evil? Do you decide? Or do I decide? Or do we just let those who rule over us, the government, the legislators, do we let them decide? Well, that would mean that Nazism and that communism under Stalin wasn't evil. Do we really believe that. And another problem for the atheist is that if there is no God, if there is no creator, if everything that we see is the result of evolution, then that would mean that the universe, our world, has gradually been evolving, gradually getting better and better over an infinite period of time. Well, then, surely by now then, everything would be perfect. Evolution and natural selection would have done its job. Or at the very least, surely, things would be getting demonstrably better. Well, do you see any signs of growing perfection, moral or otherwise, in our world? Do you even think that we are progressing, that pain and suffering and evil are in retreat? No, I believe the reality of pain and of suffering and of evil are bigger problems for the atheist than for the Christian. Once you get beyond the superficial, I don't believe in God, to actually and really thinking things through. In fact, in recent years, there's been what's described as a resurrection in faith 
among Western philosophers, the big thinkers of our time. Not that they're all coming to faith in God as revealed in Christ, but in that more and more of these men and women are coming to see that we cannot do without the basic concept of God. That without God, the world just doesn't make sense. So you see, the same people who in the 60s were proclaiming God is dead are now rather more quietly, because people are usually quiet when it comes down to admitting their mistakes, they're saying basically, sorry, maybe we got it wrong. And this will filter its way through society. So don't be surprised in the relatively near future to see an increased interest and an increased openness to faith. Here's a quote that I found in the highly respected American magazine, Time. In a quiet revolution in thought and argument that hardly anyone could have foreseen only two decades ago, God is making a comeback. Most intriguingly, this is happening not amongst theologians or ordinary believers, but in the crisp intellectual circles of academic philosophers, whose where cons the consensus had long banished the Almighty from fruitful discourse. Well, let's try and see why this is so. Why, in the context of a world of pain and suffering, thinking men and women are turning back to God. So let's go back to the question. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? And the answer I believe that the Bible gives, and that is in a really, a very real sense, we can trace all our suffering back to sin. Back to the fact that we as man and woman, that we have chosen to sin. That is to rebel against God. That's what sin is. And the result, as a result of that, we have put our world into a turmoil. We've turned our lives into a sense of chaos. Now, in much of the suffering that goes on in the world, the relationship be between these, our sin and suffering, it, it, it's fairly direct and obvious. I mean, when a drunken driver kills a pedestrian, when a football hooligan knives an innocent bystander, when an adult abuses a child, when gangs terrorizing, terrorize a housing estate, or when nations hoard food while refusing to give aid to the starving, when governments declare war on one another because of greed and a hunger for power, while seemingly oblivious to the horrors that are involved. Well, can we blame God for these things? Surely not. Surely not. Surely blame has to be laid a lot closer to home. As C.S. Lewis puts it, it is men, not God, who have produced racks, whips, prisons, slavery, guns, bayonets, and bombs. It is by human avarice or human stupidity that we have poverty or overwork. However, having said all of this, there's a whole other area of suffering out there, isn't there? Like global pandemics such as we're suffering just now like famine and drought, etc., like the so-called natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and the like. But let's not here miss the point, though, that in these areas, too, much of the, the resulting suffering can be, be traced back to man. Our current pandemic, for instance, most likely uh, emerged from the wet markets of China or even, as President Trump has suggested, was produced by men in the labs of Wuhan. And as for, for earthquakes, another example, uh, as early as 1906, earthquakes were being monitored and the reason for the devastation that was caused scrutinized. So after the first San Francisco earthquake, a doctor, Nakamura, he was sent by the Japanese government to assess why there'd been such extensive damage and colossal loss of life. His conclusion, the main reason, dishonest mortar was responsible for nearly all of the damage. With that conclusion being applicable to 
Well, nearly every earthquake since, though, the lesson has been learned in some places. For instance, in the last San Francisco earthquake, almost no lives were lost. However, having said all of this, though, that, that so much of the suffering in this world can be attributed to, directly to man, and I believe can be traced straight back to the sin of man, to the fact that we have turned our back on God, His ways and standards. And yet, that's surely not true of all that suffered in this world, is it? For how can we blame men for that which is out with their control? I mean, we can take the blame for much of the suffering in this world, say the amount of suffering even that's caused by epidemic or famine or drought or earthquake or tornado. But it wasn't men that brought these things into being, was it? Well, not directly, but I believe these things also can be traced back indirectly to our sin. To the fact that, that because of our sin, because of the corporate sin of all mankind, because of this, this world, the whole created order, that that was created and intended to be perfect and good, has instead, because of sin, been thrown into a state of chaos and disarray with Romans 8.22 giving us, I think, something of a, an insight into this, where there it says that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. You see, it would seem that in, in some way that's beyond our understanding, that our sin threw the whole world off balance and introduced pain and suffering into our experience. Peter Williams, in his book, The, the Case for God, he says that science shows us that only very small changes in the structure of the universe and its physical laws would result in a totally different universe, one devoid of intelligent life. We see, it would seem that we have introduced a very very small change into the structure of the universe in our sin. And that it hasn't produced a world devoid of intelligent life, though you would sometimes wonder. But what it has done is that it's introduced pain and suffering into this world that God created to be very good. But wait a minute here. Are we just trying to get God off the, suff off the hook of pain and suffering? Can it be right just to lay all the blame at man's feet? I mean, God made this world. Surely he's got to take some of the responsibility for the state that it's in. Well, let's move a little bit behind the scenes here. We're saying that it's our sin, our rebellion against God, which either directly or indirectly leads to that experience of pain and suffering in our world. But what goes on, though, when we sin? Who are the characters involved? Well, first of, of all, of course, there's us, mankind. For it's we who chose to sin and we who set the whole process into motion. But you know, maybe you're thinking, hey, wait, stop right there. But why did God make us with this ability? Why didn't he instead make us unable to sin? Then he could have saved both us and himself an awful lot of pain and heartache. Yeah, but you see, God made us free. He made us free so that we could freely love him. And so that in freedom, we could enjoy both him and this life and this world to the ultimate. For only a free being can achieve the, the kind of fulfillment of potential that God wants for man, the pinnacle, the very peak of his creation. But for freedom really to be freedom, it has to include the freedom to make wrong choices. It has to include the freedom to fail. Now, sometimes here, again, people want to, to jump in. But God's all-powerful. So couldn't God have made us free, but without the freedom to sin? But that, you know, that's illogical. That's a, a contradiction. 
It's like saying, can God make round squares? Can God make colorless colors? And what this demonstrates is a misunderstanding of what it means for God to be all-powerful. For what that means isn't that God can do anything. It doesn't mean that. But here, and I'm quoting here, that he can do anything that doesn't contradict his essential characteristics. So you see, God can't be illogical. God can't be irrational. He can't be self-contradictory. He can't be because of who fundamentally he is. And so God can't create a freedom that isn't really freedom. His nature, who he is, won't allow it. However, in this whole process of sin and suffering, and although we and, and, and our freedom have a, a part to play, yet it is only really a bit part. The two main players are Satan, the one who tempts us to sin, and the one who in this fallen world orchestrates pain and suffering to cause the maximum possible damage. And of course, God, our God of love, who does have a part to play in this whole process of pain and suffering, not in that he's the instigator, the source of suffering, not because suffering is evil, born out of the devil's evil intentions for men and sustained by our weakness and our sin. But God does have a part to play in suffering, in that suffering always comes within the bounds of God's sovereign control. And, and what I mean by that is that God always has his hand upon the suffering and the suffering. Now, there's lots of biblical examples of this, but, but one of the best is the book of Job, where there God allowed Satan, notice, didn't command, but allowed Satan to test Job's faith, so as to prove it true, so as to refine it, and to produce at the end of it all a Job who had grown, who had matured in every way, but particularly in his knowledge of and in his love for his God. What's important to notice, though, is, is that God, in his sovereign power, sets very real limits on how far Satan can go with Job. Job 1 verse 2 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Well, have you got the picture? Have you got it so far? Why do we suffer? We suffer because of the direct and indirect effects of sin, and particularly because we choose to sin. And in this experience, Satan is involved as the instigator of sin and therefore of suffering, and involved also in that he seeks to turn every circumstances to our worst advantage. He's always at work seeking to destroy both us and our fellowship and experience of God through our suffering. As for the Lord, though, well, he never instigates suffering. For that which is evil does have no part in him. He does, though, I believe, sometimes permit suffering for reasons that we'll look at in a little bit more detail later, but certainly to discipline us, to, to lead us back to him when we go astray. But what he always does is involve himself in our suffering in his sovereign power. He involves himself to limit our suffering. He involves himself that through our suffering, though it's intended for evil, that it might instead be turned to his glory and our good and our blessing. Well, uh, I want to move us on now uh, to just explore some of these themes in, in a bit of depth by by looking here at the question, what do Christians specifically have to say to those who suffer? Well, of course, we can and we have to hear talk about the cross, don't we? We have to talk about the cross. 
We have to say that there at that cross, by Christ's sacrifice, Christ has dealt with our sin and the cause of our suffering. And that at that cross, God there gives us a promise, the promise that no matter what we suffer, that He can overcome, that He can bring glory and blessing from it, and that He will be with us. For at the cross, what there seemed to be the ultimate tragedy and the ultimate victory of evil instead brought the ultimate good and demonstrated the victory of God. So the Lord says, as we suffer, look to that cross and trust me. Trust me. Though you can't understand what you're going through, though you perhaps do not deserve the degree of suffering that you're going through. Trust me. Trust me that I am with you in it and that I can bring good from it in a way that you perhaps cannot now understand no matter what it is you're going through. You see, because of, of the nature of the world that we live in, a world that's thrown off balance by our sin and by our abuse of freedom. Well, the fact that we will suffer a degree of pain and suffering is inevitable. We're going to do it. Let me just quote again from Peter Williams. He says that modern physics shows us how the cost of suffering caused by natural disasters is necessary for the gain of our existence. For the basic constants of nature are so interconnected that even small changes in a single law would have a catastrophic knock-on effect. Ridding the world of this conflict would eliminate the natural world altogether. And, and as we said, God can't in some way lift us out of this. He can't. No, in this world, the price of our freedom and the penalty of our sin is that we have to endure pain and suffering and death. But what God, again, what He does promise is that He can bring good out of our suffering. What He does promise is that He will be with us as we suffer. How, though, can God bring good out of suffering? How can it be possible, as one writer I looked at recently said, that even the worst atrocity has the potential for good. Well, you know, I think we'll only ever really understand this when we really grasp what God's greatest desire, what His ultimate purpose in each of our lives is. And that is not to make us happy and not to make us comfortable in this life, though I believe the Lord does love to see His people happy. But no, God's greatest desire, His purpose for our lives, is that we might grow closer to Him in this life, and that so because of that, we might be better prepared for the life of heaven that is to come. You see, the Lord wants to use, the Lord is able to use what we go through in this life in order to spiritually prepare us for the life that is to come to prepare us for that time in, when in heaven we will finally and fully there enjoy his victory over sin and death and suffering that now we know just in part. And what happens is that in some instance, what we suffer for no apparent reason, there's nothing desperately wrong or desperately sinful in our lives, nothing we can track it back to. What happens is this just turns us to God. We throw ourselves upon God in our need. We, we open up our lives to Him. And we find then that in some indescribable way, that in the midst of all our pain and all our suffering, that God takes us into His arms. He gives us His peace in our heart. That He carries us through. You know, I've read of that happening in the lives of God's people and you know, a number of years ago, I always wondered in my cynicism, is this just people trying to sound spiritual? 
Is this the, them just saying what they're supposed to say? Some kind of spiritual self-delusion. But you know, then I went through a time of real darkness in my own life. And I did. I threw myself on God. And I could hardly fathom it. I still cannot understand it. But unworthy as I am, and I am, God came to me. Sometimes, though, there are things wrong in our life. Sometimes there are. We know there are. There are things that are holding us back from growing in the Lord. Well, then, at those times, God does allow things to come into our lives to turn us back to Him. I like the way that, that one writer put it, that pain can be the pinprick that breaks the bubble of our self-delusion. And, you know, this, I believe, applies to us not just individually, but also nationally. And that the Bible teaches us that God is sovereign over the nations. Now, as an example, I don't believe that this got me, means that God made COVID happen because God's not the instigator of evil and God takes no joy in human pain and suffering. But I'll tell you this, it certainly means that he knew COVID was coming. And it certainly means that he is able to use even this experience to further his purposes and to teach us lessons that we need to learn, whether we choose to learn them. That's a, a different thing. Now, by nature, as human beings, I believe that, that we are sinners who are rebellious towards God. And I think that's reflected in, in our society and that more and more in recent days, we've left God out. We really have. We've reached that point. We've given no thought to God in terms of our laws or our values or morals. It's been a case of we are in control. We're in charge of our own destiny and we'll make our own decisions. Now what COVID, I hope, has done is that it has burst the bubble of our egotistic sense of control. It's reminded us of how frail and how limited we actually are. It's reminded us that the way that we live, the choices that we make, can have devastating repercussions. We see this now physically with, with, with COVID. We do, but I believe this may well just be a foreshadowing of what spiritually and morally is coming our way. Lest we change our ways and turn back to God. But from all of this that I've said, I hope you can see that as a nation, God is ready to come to us as we come back to us as we come back to him, sorry. And that individually, I hope you can see that what Christianity above all else is about is the living presence of Jesus Christ here and now in the midst of our pain. You see, ultimately, what Christianity actually offers to those who suffer is not easy, part answers, but rather it is a person. It's one who understands. It's one who's been there. It's a God who has suffered more because of sin than we can ever imagine. And who then comes and stands with us. More who lifts us into his arms as we suffer. The old story, Footprints for Me, really says it all so beautifully. One night, a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky fly scenes from his life. For each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to the Lord and the other to him. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he there then looked back at the footprints in the sand. And he noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and the very saddest times in his life. That really bothered him. And he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I committed to follow you, that you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you most, you could leave me. The Lord replied, my precious child, I love you and would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you only saw one set of footprints, it's because it was then that I carried you. 
But I just want to finish very briefly by looking finally at our reaction when we suffer. So what should our reaction be when we go through suffering? Well, you know, going beyond all the necessary initial steps, like seeing if this is pointing to the fact that there's, there's some sin in our life that needs dealt with, or maybe that there's something in this life that we're holding on to too tightly that God wants to loosen our grip on. But getting beyond all this, I think what we have to learn to do as we suffer is to submit to God in it. Now, by that, I don't mean give in to our suffering. I don't mean lie down to it and get all passive. No, what I mean here is turn to God in it above all else and cry out to him. Open your heart and your life to him. Say to him, Lord, even though I don't perhaps know what's happening here, why I or those that I love are going through what they are going through. I don't, Lord. Yet in this, I give myself to you. Help me to grow in my knowledge of you. Help me to grow in my experience of your love. Help me to grow in you that your glory might be all the more clearly seen in my life. The most marvelous example that I've yet encountered of just this kind of attitude is a man I met way back when I was a student during a, doing a summer pastorate in Leicester, and I visited with the, the pastor of the church, a man in a nursing home who'd once been a sea captain, but who was then struck down by some mystery disease. First, he, he went blind, but he continued still to be an active witnessing Christian. But his disease progressed. And by the time I met him, he was chair-bound, incontinent, dribbling at the mouth, and it was very difficult to, to grasp and understand what he was saying. His wife told me, though, that he had never uttered a word of complaint. Though she wondered, why him? Why him? This man who followed God and loved him. Why him? Why my husband? One day, though, her husband did manage to share something with me. And he told me that some people who'd known him prior to his illness had one day said to him, you'll be finished with God now then. You'll be finished with him. His reply was, never. Never. He's closer to me and more precious to me now than he has ever been. You know, it dawned on me then, but the awareness of this has grown through the years. That this man who was so broken in body was just so whole and complete in Christ. And what a witness he was to the gospel, to everyone in that, that home that he was in. Physically, he'd lost everything. They all knew that. But spiritually, he still had Jesus. And talking to him, you could actually tell that he had what really matters. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm too much of a coward to want to share in that experience. But I'll tell you what my prayer is. My prayer for myself and my prayer for you. It is that, Lord, if that time comes, may we too be able to turn to you and hold on to you, that we might be able to know you in something of that kind of way. Because then it will all have been worth it. Let's just pray together. Father, we want to thank you that you are the God who is sovereign. You are the God of almighty love. You are the God of sovereign power. And you are the God who never deserts, who never leaves his people. We may turn from you. We may refuse to submit to you and to seek you, but you are there for your people. Lord, help us today whatever our situation, whatever our need, to throw ourselves upon you, that we might find you to be the God who is sufficient 
for all our need. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, David, for your word with us this morning. Uh, thank you to everybody who has contributed to this morning's service. I'd just like to send us off by reading again the second verse of the first song we sung, I Will Boast in Christ. It reads this, I will boast in Christ alone, his righteousness and not my own. I will cling to Christ my hope, his mercy reigns now and forever. As we go into this week, would we know that? That Christ is our hope, that his mercy reigns as he does yesterday, today and forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that again we can come together as your people this Sunday morning. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your presence in our midst. Would you send us into this week with a gospel boldness? Would you send us into this week no matter, it, knowing that no matter the suffering and the hardship we may face, our God goes before us and our God is with us. We thank you for who you are, for all you're doing in our lives and in our midst. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week, folks. Thank you.